Welcome to Community City Church, a church where real people like you and me can experience a real God as we do real life together. My name is Edwin, I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us today for the online sermon message. We do want to let you know that we are having in-person church services, and we would love for you to join us so that you can grow in your faith by getting connected to deeper spiritual community as we learn to walk with Jesus together and change the world with Him. We meet right at the Fairway School every single Sunday at 150 Cross Street in Malden, Massachusetts at 10 a.m. Come and experience God with us live and in person. And if you are unable to join us, we are so glad that you are here. We hope that today's sermon will encourage and build your faith as you see that God is moving in your life and in your circumstances. Enjoy the message. Would you please join me for our reading of scripture? Today's reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Please follow along in your own Bible or with the scriptures on the screen. Again, that is Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand? looking into heaven this jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven then they returned to jerusalem from the mount called olivet which is near jerusalem a sabbath day journey away and when they had entered they went up to the upper room where they were staying peter and john and james and andrew philip and thomas bartholomew and matthew james the son of alphaeus and simon the zealot and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Community City Church. I'm happy to be with you. Uh, once again, and I'd like to begin this morning with a few questions. Do you remember those times when you were first uh, thinking about Jesus and what it was to follow him? Do you remember times when your heart was being pulled in that direction? Can you remember when you finally said, yes, Jesus, I will follow you. I want you in my life. Can you remember other times when there was perhaps doubt, confusion, wondering? Were there times in your life when you were wondering if God knew what he was doing in your life, where you were disappointed with the way your life was going? Can you remember times of intense grief and sorrow? And finally, can you remember times when you were longing for something really important to happen, hoping, waiting, wanting something to happen in your life. Perhaps you're in one of those times right now, a time of sorrow, a time of confusion, a time of doubt, or maybe even you're having the first pull on your heart towards Jesus, and you're considering if following Jesus is what you would like to do. Let's look at the passage we just read. Jesus' earthly career had finished, and he's given his disciples one final instruction before returning to heaven. He's telling them, I want you to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. But first, you must wait to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus' followers return to Jerusalem, and they wait there in an upper room, but they're not just waiting, they're waiting in prayer. And look who is there. His male disciples are there, of course, expected. A group of women who had often followed him, they were also there, expected. And then it says that Jesus' mother 
and Jesus' brothers are also there. Hmm. Wait. Jesus' mother and brothers were there? Mary's still in the story? Mary is listed with the other disciples? She's waiting, praying with the other disciples? Does this mean that Mary is also a disciple? Has Jesus' mother become one of his followers? Someone who listens and follows his instructions? This idea of Mary as a disciple surprises many of us. How did Mary, the mother of Jesus, become a follower of her son? How did Mary get to this place? We first meet Mary in the Gospels when her life is turned upside down by the angel who announces that she will give birth to a son who will be the savior of the world. From expectant mother to waiting disciple, how did this journey happen? Catholics revere her. Many Protestants dismiss her. Catholics may also almost deify her. Many Protestants just ignore her. Observing the life of Mary in the Gospels will help us to understand what it means to follow Jesus. The Gospels tell us how she develops as a Christ follower. We have a longitudinal record of her life. So let's pay attention and learn from her life. Well, we will see that she said, yes, God, that she waited upon God, that she took God's word in her heart and treasured it. We will see what she had periods of intense grief and sorrow. And then we will look at her life at the end where she's waiting and praying with the other disciples, hoping for a better world. We are in the midst of a sermon series, Unsung Heroes. What happens when ordinary people remain faithful to an extraordinary God? Looking at this unsung hero, we will answer, what does it mean to follow Jesus through the changing seasons of life? The term unsung hero regarding Mary must be qualified. To many, Mary is a sung hero. She's the earthly mother of our Lord. But this message is not about that. Rather, we will look at Mary's life as an unsung hero, a model of what it means to follow Jesus through life's changing seasons. We will look at snapshots, five snapshots of Mary's life, and we will see this progression from expectant mother to waiting disciple. And by observing her life, we will learn valuable lessons of what it means to follow Jesus through turbulent, changing seasons. Snapshot number one, God summons Mary, and her response is yes. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Uninvited, the angel Gabriel steps into Mary's life and tells her what is about to happen. This encounter is instructive, and it actually challenges some of ideas, our ideas about God. Sometimes the Lord gives a gentle invitation, and at other times he issues a summons. He'll invite us, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And at other times he compels us, follow me. God through the angel compels Mary. He does not say, Mary, would you like to be the earthly mother of the Savior of the world? Would you like to participate in the incarnation? There's nothing gentle about this. The angel says, look, Mary, you will give birth to a son, the Messiah, God in the flesh. This will happen. And by the way, God, the Holy Spirit, is the Father. Figure out how to tell your parents and goodbye. 
Mary does not resist. She's not afraid. She wonders how she could get pregnant. And she wonders about the scandal and all the things that could come her way because of this. But this is what's going to happen. God compels her, summons her, and she responds, yes. What was it like for you? Do you remember those early days of awakening to Jesus calling you? Was it a gentle prodding, a gentle invitation, or was it a compelling reality, a situation where saying yes to Jesus was the only viable option? Perhaps you're here today because you're curious, you're seeking. Do you feel a tug? Do you feel a pull on your heart? Do you feel a growing attraction to Jesus? I just encourage you to pay attention to that tug. Pay attention to that growing attraction to Jesus. For me, the call was a summons. In 1977, I was a lost soul. I was traveling around the country by myself. It was the 70s. I stuck out my thumb and hitchhiked. I traveled around the country and I hitchhiked my way to Harrisburg, Oregon, and a place called the Holy House. And there I went inside and I spoke to the house parent and I told him all my ideas about religion and spirituality in the world. And he said, Joe, that's all fine and good, but you need Jesus in your life. And my life was immediately turned upside down. It was a summons, or you could say it was turned right side up. No was not an option. We understand respectful prodding. We understand gentle invitation. We understand how a nice God, the creator of the universe, could be so gentlemanly in the way he treats us. But I'm not sure in 2024 that we understand summons. While we may have begun following Jesus with a gentle invitation, do we understand a God enough that he could intervene in our lives with a summons? Can you comprehend a God that will step into your life and compel you to change direction? A God who will compel you to stop, go, you, stop you from going your own way and for you to begin going in his way? Do you understand of God in the Bible that could contradict you, that could compel you? Sometimes I wonder if we limit what God could do in our lives. Have you heard the call? Follow me. Did you receive the summons? Have you heard, I have chosen you? There's only one response to this invitation and to this summons, and that response is yes. Now let's look at snapshot number two, the warning and the pondering. After the summons, Mary is warned about her future and how it would be impacted because she said yes to God. When she received the warning and premonitions that following God would cost her sorrow, loss, and loss, she enters a time of treasuring God's word. Mary wonders what it will cost her that her son is the Savior. The story is 40 days after Jesus' birth, uh, Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord. And while they are there, a devout man named Simeon approaches them, and Simeon perceives that Jesus is not your everyday baby. In fact, Simeon was waiting for the day when the Messiah would come. And he sees the baby, and he knows that this is it. This is the baby. And Simeon takes the baby, and he blesses Joseph and Mary and Jesus. And he says to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul also. Can you imagine 40 days after she gives birth Mary is warned about her future, that she will suffer. Simeon warns Mary, you will have pain. Life with your baby Jesus will have suffering. Your blessed call will have sorrow and pain. This happens, friends. We receive the call to follow Jesus. And inherent to the call is suffering. There's a price. Those of us who live in rich countries, 
And this doesn't mean that everyone is rich, but we live in a rich country. We seek designer lives that preclude suffering. And when it comes, we don't know how to deal with it. But Jesus even said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus teaches us that in this world, we will have trouble. And Mary teaches us that Christ followers will know that they will suffer. Christ followers know that hard times will come, and they are not surprised when hard times happen. And instead of turning away, they turn towards God, leaning upon Jesus during these times of suffering. Now let's keep going. When Jesus was 12, his parents took him to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. And you have to picture a whole community of people traveling down to Jerusalem. And when they returned home, Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. They were traveling back home with a large group of pilgrims. And maybe Mary thought Jesus was with Joseph. And maybe Joseph thought Jesus was with Mary. Or maybe they thought he was with friends. But they left him behind in Jerusalem. Now, this for me is very easy to understand because my wife and I, uh, we have seven uh, children. And sometimes when all our children gather at our table, they'll start telling stories of the times where we forgot them. We forgot them at church or we forgot to pick them up at a ball field. So it's very easy for me to think that, of course, Jesus and uh, Mary and Joseph uh, thought that Jesus was with someone and they left him behind. When they discover that he wasn't with them, Mary and Jesus go. Uh, Mary and Joseph go back to find Jesus, and like a lot of parents, they blame Jesus. And when they find him, Mary unloads. His mother said to him, "Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me?" Jesus asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying. And then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Think about these words. Mary treasured all of these things in her heart. She held the events surrounding Jesus' birth, his early life up until this point, she held them close. She wondered, what does he mean, my father's house? What does the prophet mean, a sword will pierce my heart? What did the angel mean that will be the savior of the world? This is the discipline of treasuring or pondering, considering, holding close God's word. This is very important to me. This discipline of pondering or treasuring God's word. I'm in the fourth quarter of life. I have a kind of designer discipline where I just put my fingers in the number four and I remind myself that I am in the fourth quarter of life. I treasure that. I hold it close so that I might make this fourth quarter of life count. A couple years ago, I was backpacking up in the Maine woods and as I sat by this beautiful lake, I was considering how I wanted this fourth quarter to go. And, and I thought, I want to give my life to people who are suffering, to people who are oppressed, to people who are downcast. And there's a scripture that I hold close, I treasure, I ponder, I pray over. It's this scripture, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I hold that word closely. I wonder how it might be fulfilled in my life. And I wonder what it would be like for me to continue to change as I age. What about you? Do you have things that you're holding in your heart? Are there scriptures or ideas or stories that you're holding, paying, uh, uh, meditating on, wondering about, pondering? Let's pay attention to this treasuring, this pondering of heart, as Mary treasured these things in her heart, considering them. 
Are there things that you're considering? Are there questions you're asking, like this question? What does it mean for me to be a Christian? What are my obligations as a Christian? How shall I respond to suffering? What does it mean for me to uh, follow Jesus through all the changing seasons of life? In our first snapshot, we saw that God summons us. He calls us, and our response in yet is yes. In the second snapshot, we see this discipline of treasuring God's word, perhaps having to say yes to God multiple times. Now let's keep looking at Mary's life to learn what it means to follow Jesus through life's changing seasons. Let's look at snapshot number three, confusion and lament. Sometimes when we follow Jesus as his disciple, there are times of serious doubt, serious confusion. There are times when we wonder, what is God doing in my life? Is he even there? And we see that even Mary had doubts about who Jesus was when he began his earthly ministry. Take a look at this scripture. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Wow. Mary, after the angel's word, after Simeon's word, after living with her son for all these years, she was confused about Jesus. We know this feeling. Life is out of order. This is not what I expected. Have you thought these things? I imagine you have. Have you ever wondered, why is this happening? Why is life going in this direction? Why does everything seem to be upside down? How do we respond during times like this? We know how to respond to the summons, yes. We know how to respond to life's up and down, ups and downs. We treasure God's word. We take it in and we hold it. But how do we respond to confusion, to doubt? We pour out our complaints. We lament. We tell God exactly how we're feeling. And we tell God how we're feeling energetically. We do not hold back our words or our complaint towards God. We pray like this prayer in Psalm 13, which is a great example of a lament in times of confusion. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. It's a powerful lament. It's a powerful complaint. Four times, how long, Lord? How long, Lord? How long, Lord? How long, Lord? How long will these things keep happening? And when will it end? When we enter times of confusion, when life is not going the way we expected it, when we have times of serious doubt, I encourage you to pour out your complaint, your complaint. Notice the heart of this psalm. It's a complaint, and then there is a confession of trust. When we have these times of confusion and doubt, pour out complaint, and then confess a trust in the ultimate wisdom and knowledge of God. For me, in almost 50 years of following Jesus, I've had many times of confusion and doubt. Times when life was painfully sorrowful. Times when family life, church life, church leaders, everything seemed to be thrown into confusion and life just hurt. And when I closed a church plant that I had started back in 2010 and I left church leadership, there was a hard times of confusion. Times when I could hardly pay my bills and had enough to make ends me. These were difficult, painful times of confusion, doubt, 
What is going on right now? I don't understand. These are times for lament. What about you? Have you had times of confusion? Times when you doubted God was even there? Is he there? Does he care about me? Can I even trust him? Is it even worth it? If you had those times, or if you perhaps are having one of those times right now, pour out your complaint. This is so important. I will say it again. If you are having one of these times of confusion and doubt, wondering why your life is going in this direction, pour out your complaint. And now let's look at snapshot number four. Lean into grief. We see Mary at the cross at her son's unjust crucifixion. Let's read in the scriptures. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. Also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments in among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Simeon warned Mary that a sword would pierce her heart. And here it is. Can you imagine watching your son suffer so much? Not just dying, but dying one of the most cruel, painful, humiliating deaths imaginable. The son that she saw naked coming out of her womb is now hanging naked, held to a cross by nails. Can you imagine what this is like for a mother, how cruel what she saw. Through this, what does Mary teach us? That she was standing at the cross while her son suffered and died. What does Mary teach us about following Jesus through the changing seasons of life? She does not avoid the pain of watching her son die. She leans into the pain and she instructs us how a follower of Jesus should respond to grief and sorrow and loss. Lean in. Embrace it. Don't run away from it. Lean in. Don't do it alone. Do it with our Lord. For me, I learned something about grief and sorrow when my father died in um, 1981. I was 23 years old. By the way, if you're doing the math, that makes me 66. I was 23, 1981, and my father died suddenly of a heart attack. He just dropped dead. What a blow to my family. If tears could have brought him back, he would be alive today. And in the months and years that followed, I would grieve. And I'd lean into that grief. When I felt like crying, I cried. When I wanted to be alone, I was alone. When I wanted to yell, I yelled. I let grief have its way, and then I got on with my life and did the things that I was supposed to do. And I'm experiencing some grief right now. It's a grief that'll be hard for others to understand because my wife and I have our first empty nest after 42 years. What we didn't know is that the last person to leave our home would be our 10-year-old granddaughter, Eleanor. Eleanor lived in her, our home with her mom for 10 years. Then her mom got a job in Denver and Eleanor moved to Denver just a couple of weeks ago. And I'm grieving. I haven't cried this much since my father died. This ongoing grief, this sorrow, this pain that she has actually moved out of our house. And I know it's hard for people to understand because it's a grandchild. 
And people will say nice things to me, well-meaning things to me, and they're trying to comfort me. And inside, I, outside I say thank you, and inside I say no. I refuse to be comforted. I am sad. And I lean into that pain, and I lean into that sorrow, and lean into that loss. I want to encourage you, if you are in a period of grief, lean in. Lean in with Jesus. So far, so far, we have said today, in snapshot number one, if God summons you, say yes. Treasure God's word. Hold it close. Have scripture or have stories or have ideas about God that you're mulling over and over again. We've said in snapshot number three to, to lament through times of confusion and doubt. And now here in snapshot number four, we're saying lean in to Jesus when you are suffering, when you are grieving. And finally now, snapshot number five, waiting for a better world. In the opening scripture, we read that the disciples and Mary wanted to know when God would restore all things. In other words, they were asking, when will everything that's wrong with the world become right? When would justice prevail? When would pain and suffering stop? When would the oppressed be set free? When would sin and all its ugly effects be removed and turned away and turned around? Jesus told them to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that their job was to go and make the world a better place. That their job was to go to the ends of the earth and make followers of Jesus, every corner of the globe. And so, in our opening scripture, they waited. They waited in prayer. They waited expectantly. They weren't passive. They were, they were actively calling out to God for this time when the world would be made a better place. Let's read that portion of the scripture again. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room, where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. And all of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Mary was there waiting, praying, expecting, hoping for the Holy Spirit. She was a disciple. She was a follower. She went through this whole trajectory from expectant mother through all these times of turbulation and, and, and trial and grief and loss from expectant mother to waiting disciple. Jesus, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is now the follower of her son. And they were waiting for a day, a special day, a day that all disciples of Christ wait for. A day when there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more suffering. When all that is wrong with the world will be turned around. This is the day we wait for. This is the day we hope for. This is the day we work for. Let me read to you from the book of Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be as God, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And listen to this now. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So this beautiful scripture, this is the day that we wait for a day when there'll be no more crying, no more tears, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more death. When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're asking. We're asking that God would make these things real in our world today. And God calls us to work for those things in, the, in our corner of the world. How can we make our corner of the world a better place? We looked at Mary's life today. We looked at a number of snapshots. We saw that 
when there's a summons, our only response could be yes. We saw that that's the importance of treasuring God's word, of holding God's word close to us. We saw that during times of confusion and doubt, we could pour out our lament. And we saw that it's important to lean into grief, to not resist it, but to lean into it, but not to do it alone, but to do it with our Lord. And in this fifth snapshot, we're seeing what it is to wait and hope and work for a better world. Do you hear that call? Are you hearing the voice of God calling you, summoning you? I encourage you to say yes. I encourage you to treasure God's word in your heart, to hold it close. I encourage you during times of confusion and doubt to pour out lament. Are you confused? Are you disappointed with the way life is going? Pour it out in prayer. Are you in pain and suffering? Lean into grief and do it with Jesus. And finally, long for a better world. Let's work together. Let's work together in Malden and the surrounding towns to see this place become a better place. A place where Jesus is honored and pain is alleviated because people are coming to the knowledge of Christ. Let's pray together. And if you have this tug on your heart today, especially, that you never came to this point where you have said, yes, Jesus, I will follow you. I encourage you to do that right now, to say yes. And perhaps some of you have followed Jesus for a long time. I encourage you to say yes again. In whatever season of life you are in, I encourage you to say yes. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we look to you. You're the author of all that is good in this world, the author of life. We pray for a day, Lord, when you will restore all things and you will make everything that is wrong in this world right. We see so many problems and issues surrounding us from around the world. But we ask you to help us, Lord, in this town, in the Malden and surrounding towns. May it grow in your righteousness, your joy, and your peace. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we go, that we might be a witness to your life, to everyone around us. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.